This week on CrossFeed. Can the unbaptized take communion? What about dogs? Foster parenting and sexuality. Revisited. Congress examines Islam. And heaven is for real. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religion News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Hey, I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. Hello on this uh, daylight savings time weekend when we're all real tired because we lost our sleep last night. Yep. Yeah. Oh, man. But, hey, uh, we have an app. I'm really excited about this. Uh the Shepherd of the Ridge has now has an app in the um, iTunes App Store. So if you just go there, go in, in iTunes to you know the to the store, and you just type in Shepherd of the Ridge, you'll find it. Or in fact, if you type in North Ridge Valley, you'll find it too. <laughs> oh. Well, we don't have an app. <clears throat> we, uh, we we just keep busy and do other things out here. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sitting here in my easy chair tonight, folks. So if I move around, because I move my one of my legs around, so slacker, live with it. So, um, <clears throat> oh, let's get going tonight. Here, um, where should we begin? Oh, let's begin with communion. Okay, we're heading into um, Lent, and we'll be talking Holy Week soon. And there's two stories here about they both deal with Anglicans. Interesting enough. Mm -hmm. So, um. So, the first one is a question of can you give communion to someone who's not baptized? No. (laughs) Well, that was my reaction, too. And, but this is the, the question that they're sort of asking, and, um. There's some Anglicans in. Canada who are asking this question. And um, the idea is already rejected by a dangerous step by more orthodox Anglicans. I was raised in which an Ontario church pastor um, says, quote, according to the paper, removing the requirement of baptism would help stop the decline in the number of Anglican attending services, unquote. No, it will not. Every time we water down doctrine or teaching, it leads to a further decline. Well, what it comes down to is it all the more sort of de-emphasizes the importance of any substance to your teaching. Right. How in our multicultural and pluralistic society can our churches be places of hospitality if we exclude table fellowship with the non-baptized? This is not an academic question, wrote Reverend Nicolosi pastor of St. James Westminster Anglican Church in London, Ontario, an official church consultant on how to build membership. Man, if this is your consultant, you've got to get somebody new. How about asking this question? How in, our, how in a multicultural and pluralistic society could the early church be places of hospitality if they excluded table fellowship for the non-baptized? But they managed to do it, and the church managed to grow. Like crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, what it comes down to is if you water things down so much that you've got nothing left, that even the, you know, the most basic thing like baptism is, is treated as a, a completely peripheral sort of thing that's, that has no, um, significant value, no necessity. What do you have left? You know, people are going to come and go, Oh, I felt really welcome. And then they're going to go to the bar and they're going to say, and I felt really welcome. You know, I, you, you want people to feel welcome when they walk in and go, Norm, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, I don't understand, but this is, um, well, many who come to church do not feel welcome because they're not feel able to fully participate. It's like ad inviting someone to Sunday dinner and not feeding them a meal. Well, if, you know, no, 
baptism is always the entry point. Baptism is the beginning sacrament. That is the place at which, you know, now either it's a means of grace, which brings us into the church, or it is a confession of faith in Christ, depending on how you want to look at it. Okay? It can maybe it's even a little bit of both. But it's always the beginning point. Uh, and to, to, to commune someone who's not baptized. Matter of fact, because, because if you're not baptized, you know, there's a certain, to a certain extent, you're not Christian. Right. Yeah, you know, I mean, if you're going to use his analogy, no, it's, you're, you're inviting anybody to come and, Mm -hmm. um, sort of to come and eat. All right. In the sense of if you want to, if you want to compare the service to a, a dinner, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll invite guests into my home. Okay. But this is something that's, um, the Lord's Supper is a, uh, it's something that's for the family. Right. right? Well, actually, it's even more because it's one thing for me to invite somebody to my table. It's something for me to invite somebody else to, to invite somebody to somebody else's table. Right. Oh, right, and right. The, and this Good is point. the Lord's table. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, not my table. Yeah. And that's um, not our place. You know, I mean, I, I was just thinking of what, what would be analogous if you want to use that, that comparison though. It would be the equivalent of, of saying, well, I'm not, I'm not just inviting them to, um, to my, to eat at my table. I'm inviting them to sleep in my bed, you know? And I mean, really, if you talk about the church being the bride of Christ and, and, and that kind of thing, that, you know, that's kind of what you're talking about that. And like, even, you know, my kids, if they're scared or something like that, and, and they wanted to come climb in bed with mom and dad or something like that, they'd be welcome to do that. All right. If we had a house guest, they would not be welcome in our bed. I know. I, I know. I was not welcome at all. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so did you feel like we were shunning you? <laughs> oh, terribly. I was terribly shunned. <laughs> I just want you to, 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 to know that I was terribly shunned. Uh, no, on a, you know, one guy here, you know, I think makes a lot of sense. He says, no, he says, uh, uh, it does not work this way. The Eucharist is uh, Ephraim Radner, professor of historical theology. The Eucharist is not a welcoming exercise. It's about Christ's sacrifice on the cross. It's not like a meal like any other meal. It has been clear and consistent practice through all of Christianity and shows that a baptized person has committed him or herself to Jesus. Um, and to change that is dangerous. It makes God and Christ not as holy and demanding and wonderful as the church has taught yeah. Okay. So, what about your dog? So I heard about this a while back, and I'm glad that it's been um, there's been some follow up on it. Uh, this is uh, Reverend Marguerite Rea of St. Peter's Anglican Church in Toronto, Canada. This is the second Anglican Church in Toronto. <laughs> All right, so if you're looking for a church, <laughs> all right, um, you received complaints from Christians all over Canada after she fed communion bread to a German shepherd cross named Trapper. Um, so basically, you've got... Uh, um, here, began last month when four-year-old Trapper and his owner, Donald Keith, 56, attended the church in Toronto's downtown area for the first time. Minister welcomed me and said, come up and take communion. So we don't know if he's baptized. Um, and Trapper came up with me, and the minister gave him communion as well. I thought it was a nice way to welcome me into the church. I thought it was acceptable. There was an old lady in the front just beaming when she saw this. Um, yeah, not all parishioners at the service were quite so charmed by the sight of the priest leaning down and placing a wafer on the wagging tongue of Trapper. And it says communion bread is considered by Anglicans to represent the body of Christ. So we would and take what even... Kind of Anglican you are, you may, may mean much more. Right. Um, so, I, wow. You know, it says... Uh, 
She says, I, I thought I was, it was innocent and made me think of the blessing of the animals. <laughs> uh, the, the whole spiritual level here of all these people is just incredibly low. Including I mean, the said, priest. Well, yeah, I'm going to come to, come, come to Pastor Idiot here in a minute. Anyway, 99.9% .9 of the people in the church love Trapper and the kids play with him. It's just one person got his nose out of joint. Now, you know what? Uh, we had a blind guy when I first came to St. Luke's. And uh, he had a seeing eye dog named Brady, and we all love Brady. Um, you know, a hundred percent of the people love Brady uh, uh, in our church. And Brady would bring his master up for communion, and Brady would sit right next to him while his master communed. I never communed with Brady. You didn't? No, I didn't. How it would unwelcoming. Have been, yes, it would have been. If I had, I God, they would, I would have caught holy hell for you know, for for good reasons too. Um, uh, you know, yeah, Ms. Ray said it had been a simple act of reaching out to a new member, congregation member and his pet. Oh, lady, you're an idiot. This is, you know, this is a sacred act. It's not for dogs. Um, okay. First, there's this theological stupidity here. And then there is this mealy mouth, um, so-called apology. If I have upset, ups, hurt, upset, or embarrassed anyone, I apologize. Hey, lady, can I finish the sentence? But if I haven't hurt, upset, or embarrassed you, I don't apologize. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is you people are offended. Yeah. That's what it means. Okay, well, you... She has no clue what she did wrong. No. Nah. You, you've upset Christ. Okay, because it's his body and blood that you fed to the dog. All right? Or his body anyway. All right. Well Jesus just said didn't don't don't put pearls before before swine. He never said don't put biscuits before dogs. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, you know there's I, I think I, I got better exegesis than she does. <laughs> There was I, was I was talking to somebody, and this relates to both of these um, articles. Um, there's there's a expression that's that's going around um, Lutheran circles at least that says uh, evangelism is not worship, and worship is not evangelism. All right, and I, I I agree and I disagree with that statement. All right, I mostly agree. All right, that that worship is specifically designed for the believers. At the same time, it needs to be accessible enough that new believers or uh, people who are still trying to figure things out um, that it doesn't completely alienate them. That's why we don't do service in Latin. Okay. Um, it, and it needs to be in the, uh, in the language of the people so that um, to, to use another analogy, uh, when I was in college, um, I was taking a calculus class and my uh, teaching assistant was from China and had a very, very thick accent. And, um, and and he was he was a nice guy and all, but I got nothing out of going to our our sectional classes where he was teaching, because his accent was so thick that I spent the whole time trying to make sense of what he was saying, um, trying to sort of cut through the accent and and in a sense translate him, um, uh, even though he was speaking proper English, and so that um by the time I sort of made out the words he was already on to the next thing and, and I couldn't really think about what he'd actually said. It drove me crazy and I really struggled in that class because of that. All right. So, um, to bring that back to worship, it needs to be something that people don't have to sit there and kind of translate the whole thing the whole time. You shouldn't have to have a theological degree to understand what's going on. All right. Um, but at the same time, we can't make it so approachable that it's the rotary club. You know, well, I, 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 I know. Maybe you can make it so approachable to the Rotary Club. But even if you make it so approachable to your, your Rotary Club, you don't take the communion wafers and put them in a doggy dish. You know, I mean, the only person who's going to do something like this, I hate to say it, it's going to be, you know, some liberal who doesn't understand what's going on. I don't think you would find a conservative or evangelical pastor of any stripe that would that would do something like this. 
Well, I don't think you find anybody that, that really takes seriously what communion is by any sort of historic understanding of communion, whether you believe right. in the real presence like Christian or like, sorry, like Lutherans, um, it, whether you are believe in transubstantiation like Roman Catholics, or even whether you believe that it's just some sort of like a symbolic presence um, or a spiritual presence or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. All right. You're still feeding Christ to the dogs. All right. That's, one of the accusations uh, is that, well, Jesus' body was stolen by the gardener and um, and was, you know, eaten by dogs. So, right. like, well, there's a there's a do this in remembrance of me for you. At least the bishop, you know, the pastor, you said, called them strange and shocking actions. At least he's got an idea, like, lady, you know, you, why he's leaving her in the in the parish, I don't know. Uh, I think if I'd done something like that, uh, um, I think I would have been um, uh, suspended, you know, pending, you know, some sort of understanding of the basics of theology here. Yeah, it, it really. Wow. <sighs> So, you know, I'm beginning to hurt from the Anglicans uh, up in England, uh, up in uh, Canada. This is the type of uh, theological drivel going on in the church. No, you know what? It's interesting. The first, that first article we said, the guy said there's 1.6 million um, um, Anglicans, and now it's about 500,000. Well, you know, when you've got this kind of theological drivel going on, there's nothing there that's going to interest people. Right. Even back in the 1960s, there was a book called Why Conservative Churches Are Growing. Even then, they saw the trend that it was a. There's another book, and I've mentioned it before, The Empty Church. But, you know, people people don't want to hear pap. You yeah. know? They, if they want they that, they'll watch there. Oprah. That's right, you know. Um, or Jersey Shore. <laughs> All right. Mm. You know, people are looking for substance, right? Not dog food. Pastor Snooky, oh. <laughs> she'd do you well. Know, I, there. I, 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 I only, I've, I've never watched Jersey Shore. I just Me hear either. about. It. I, I've seen a couple episodes of Leno that had you know people from there. Um, oh, anyway, I've seen clips, and I want nothing to do with it. I don't understand that show. I don't understand why people watch it, except in morbid fascination. The same way that you slow down and look when you see a ambulance next to a horrible car wreck on the side of the road and you look to see if you can see anybody <laughs> it's that sort of morbid fascination like ooh how bad is it you know or or else or else you watch it in um uh, in uh arrogance and and self-righteousness and say well <laughs> you know sort of i thank you lord that i'm not as horrible of a sinner as the situation <laughs> I don't sound like that. Those people, I just watch it. <laughs> anyway, so um, oh man. So do you think think the dog get to go to heaven? <laughs> well, the big question is, if he did, what would he see? Yeah, yeah. That's maybe. That's it. She went to seminary when she was watching all dogs go to heaven. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. And, you know, there's that's <laughs> one hundred and one, and you know, and and then there was like one or two sequels to that movie too. So there's your, you know. Yeah. Anyway, uh, this is interesting that we are doing the story. Uh, Heaven is for real, uh, because uh, uh, we were talking today in Bible class, and this uh, about the image of Christ. Um, and we've been studying uh, Islam, and uh, you know you don't make an image of God. And we talked about you know, uh, but you know we have our images and and, and stuff, and um, what Jesus looks like. And this book came up for discussion. One of the women said that she had read it, and this kid uh, had to you know had described Jesus, and uh, somebody else said uh, you know he kept saying all these pictures of Jesus aren't quite right, and then somebody else had uh, 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 kind of a similar near death experience, and their picture of Jesus, yeah, that's him, that's right. So I, you know, I've never known what to make out of these 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 near death experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've known people that have had them. Um, 
you know, and, and had very interesting descriptions. Uh, and, and it was especially fascinating when you sort of hear this description and you always, and like, you know, um, there's one person said, yeah, the, you know, the, the sort of bad people in a sense, um, they're like in jail kind of over away from everybody else. And I went, oh, well, the Bible talks about spirits in prison and, you know, and stuff. And it was, it was just interesting that he would use that terminology. And while he was a Christian, he was not familiar with that, um, with that sort of terminology. And, and so I kind of went, huh. Right. At the I same just, time, I don't, I just, just still think of Shrek. Whatever you do, Shrek, stay away from the light. <laughs> Well, okay, so um, we're t- we're talking about a book that um, called "Heaven Is for Real," and uh, uh, it is written by a an evangelical pastor. Um, but it is he was basically um, the uh, we call it amanuensis. Um, he manuasis. There you go. The secretary. The story. It's his son. This is his son's story. Yep. His, it was uh, two months before his son's uh, his son's name is Colton Burpo, um, and uh, it was two months uh, before his fourth birthday. Uh, he was rushed to emergency surgery with a burst appendix. He woke up with an astonishing story. He had died and gone to heaven, where he met his great grandfather, the biblical figure Samson, John the Baptist, and Jesus, who had eyes that were just sort of a sea blue that seemed to sparkle. Um, he's 11 years old now. All right. So that right there kind of, I went, huh? There's no way that Jesus had blue eyes. Because, you know, at, at, at least pre-resurrection. Um, given that he's a Middle Eastern Jew. He would have brown eyes like all Middle Eastern Jews. Um, well, so say you, Johnny Cash, says he was blonde hair, blonde and blue eyed. I saw the Gospel Road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> Ellie maybe. Swede will tell you Jesus was Swedish. I have no idea what that meant. You ever seen Christmas being celebrated among Swedes? Take a look. They're all Swedish. You know, he, Jesus is Swedish, blonde haired and everything. Well, okay, so that's an interesting um, thing that if you, like, if you look at, if you go to Japan, all right, the nativity scenes there, he's Japanese, all right, and you go to different parts of the world, and he looks like the people from that area, um, by and large, and the, the point is that he came for all people, okay, so I suppose he could appear that way, um, you know, to this boy to, to help him see him the way he needs to see him. Um, I have a little trouble with that, but my sort of uh, understanding of the biology of the resurrection, the resurrected, ascended, and glorified Christ um, (laughs) is a little shaky. Um, One of the other things that sort of raised a red flag for me um, was he was describing the bloody wounds on Jesus' palms. And, um, and, and that caught me because, you know, and all the, the like statues and pictures and stuff like that, it's always his palms, um, where the nail marks are. Uh, the thing is we know from archeology span that, um, they didn't put the nails through the palms. They put them through the wrists kind of through here. Cause that's where it would hold. They've actually found, um, skeletons with the the nail still lodged in there of people that have been crucified. Um, something else I read, though, said that in some cases they did put it through the palms. But what they would do is they would place a piece of wood over the palm first as to act as a washer. Okay, but wouldn't that break the bones in the hand? No. Well. Because we know that... I mean, I guess the it could. Now, I'm just saying... I'm just saying, man. I don't know. So, uh, you know. Well, anyway, here's the so. here's the the kind of clincher for me. I mean, or not not clincher, but the thing that really makes me go, huh? Um, and that is, 
the sort of like, how do you know that this just wasn't some sort of, you know, dream or something like that? All right. It says, uh, talking about the, the father. At first, he and his wife, Sonia, were not sure if they could believe their son's story, which came out slowly months and years after his sudden illness and operation in 2003. The details persuaded them. Uh, Colton told his parents that he had met his younger sister in heaven, describing her as a dark-haired girl who resembled his older sister, Cassie. When the Burpos questioned him, he asked his mother, You had a baby die in your tummy, didn't you? While his wife had suffered a miscarriage years before, Mr. Burpo said they had not told Colton about it. There's just no way he could have known. All right. And so I went, huh. <laughs> All right. So, so that's sort of it. I mean, and okay, could the kid have um, sort of overheard a conversation where his parents thought he was sleeping or something like that and, and they were discussing it? I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, so this is, you know, this is an interesting thing, but what it comes down to is you can't hinge your faith on it. There was that, um, there was another book similar to this written by a woman of, um, a few years back I'm trying to remember what it was called. Um, but it had like, it was almost like a Mormon kind of book or some of the stuff in it was kind of from Mormon theology. I'm trying to remember what it was called. That's not the... I don't think it's the five people you meet in heaven. No. Uh, but it was... Um, I can't remember what it was called now. But, uh, yeah, it was different. And, and so, you know, that raises... I mean, there's another interesting question of why do people of all faiths um typically on when they are dying um you know people that are uh sort of on their it's a more of a gradual sort of thing not not anything very sudden um they tend to see uh relatives that have passed away um in the past and they'll like as if they're sitting there in the room with them. Um, and it's a kind of a universal thing. And so what does that mean? Um, and what, uh, you know, what, what can we, what can we infer from that? Um, and you know, I don't know, is it just the brain, some sort of chemistry in the brain? Is it, you know, is is there something else here? I I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know either. But I think it's important that you don't you don't hang your faith on. It. You know, it's kind of like um, the Shroud of Turin. You know, there's a lot of issues. Some people say it's a hoax. Some people still say it's not. Whatever. One way or the other, you just don't hang your faith on it. Right. You know, um, that I think is the key thing, and. Um, well, at least Thomas Nelson's making money off of it. <laughs> yeah, that they are. Broken company so, sales know. records. Yep, so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, what it comes down to is, all right, and I, I was actually the, um, a couple weeks ago when we had our 30-hour famine, I was doing a, a um, Bible study with the kids, and um, and they were talking about stuff they'd seen on the History Channel and all, all kinds of weird stuff. And, um, and they said, you know, what do you – what do you make of this and stuff like that? And we talked about it a little bit and, and I said, all right, here's what it comes down to though. And I held up a Bible and I said, this is truth. All right. This is the truth. This is the truth that all other truths are, um, checked against. All right. And if it contradicts the Bible, then go back to rule number one. All right. That's the truth. And so, um, now, but, you know, when you get into these sort of experiences, what's going on there? I don't know. If you have an experience that contradicts the Bible, and now, I, okay, I use the example of, of the, um, you know, the, the nail marks and where they are or, or the color of Jesus' eyes. Okay. But the thing is, the Bible doesn't say what color Jesus' eyes were. Okay. We can be pretty confident that they weren't blue. Right. But at the same time, we know that he looked different. Um, after the resurrection, 
All right. There's these weird sort of statements after the resurrection where it says, like, nobody asked whether it was him because they knew it was or something like that. Like, oh, then why would you even say that? You know, or that, uh, you know, he appeared to a whole bunch of people and, and some doubted. Like, how do you doubt? He's standing right there, you know? Um, and, and so there's this sort of like, you know, he, he, it seems to be that he looked different, that it was still clearly him, but there was something different about him, about the way he looked. And, um, you know, so does that mean his eyes turned blue or, you know, I, I don't know. You know, he, the description that John gives in Revelation is totally different. <laughs> Their eyes are on fire, so. But that's more symbolic too. So, but you know, it, it's one of those things that I, I, I always call it a "ask him when you get there" question. You know, if if we get there and and what we see is is, is similar to to what's in the book, and we go, "Huh, what do you know?" You know, um, but there's certain things that you can guarantee that when you meet Jesus, he will have the wounds. All right, where exactly they are. Um, on his arms or hands or, you know, and, and feet and that, I, I couldn't, you know, I was going to say nail it down, but, um, I couldn't tell you exactly. Um, but, uh, and the, and the Bible doesn't sort of give diagrams. It's mostly what we know from archeology span and, and like Jim pointed out that, uh, it, just because it was it was one way sometimes doesn't mean it always was. And so even what we learn from archaeology, you sort of have to take with the understanding that your sample size is small and there's and there are exceptions too. And you have to kind of keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. But who knows? Um be interesting to read the book again. You know, it's kind of like, um, hey, I, I, hopefully it's more orthodox than the shack ever hoped to be. <laughs> Uh, the last big religious seller in America. Oh dear. Um. So, if all dogs go to heaven, do all Muslims go there too? <laughs> well, <laughs> they may or may not feel welcome at uh, in the United States. That's for sure. Now, um, okay. Yeah. Um. If you heard this week that Peter King, um, uh, Republican from New York. Started doing some, um, um, uh, uh, um, hearings into, um, radicalization of, um, Muslims here in, in uh, among Muslims here in America. And, uh, he's kind of a pugnacious guy. I mean, he's not somebody, you know, oh, man, I mean, he's, he's just kind of a rude person. So, yeah, he's not exactly a sympathetic person to be doing this stuff anyway. But, um, you know, and, and, and he, you know, I, I don't get it. I mean, you know, here's the question. I mean, there was a, you know, a uh, 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 the what, psychiatrist, yeah, you know, Fort Hood, who shot up a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. Why? You know, what did his religion have to do with it? And obviously it did. Uh, the same thing over in um, uh, Europe, where you know the guy just shot up the um, in Germany, uh, you know, sh- you know, shot a gun into a German airport, you know, shouting, you know, uh, you know, God is great in Arabic. So what what is it these people, you know, what is causing these people to become radicalized in their in their theology? Uh, the charges that he's, you know. Blanketing a whole bunch of a whole group, and he's just saying, "No, what, what, what is what is going on here, and what's the what, what's being done about it? How how is the Muslim community itself responding to this?" Um, and uh, the, uh, on the first one, of the first people who who talked was Keith Ellison, uh, a Democrat in Minnesota, who was the first mo- Muslim um, elected to Congress, and he cried through his and. As we call the young Muslim paramedic who died during the 9/11 attacks, um, and uh, you know, it said uh, he um, he actually he was going to going to um, uh, fire 
I was schooled to be a fireman at the time. And he ran in and he died. And he said something about how he had been thought to have caused it. Um, reality is there's no evidence that anybody, anybody ever said that. Mm. Uh, you can't find anybody. You can't, you can't find it. There was one newspaper article that said it, but they didn't quote anybody. They didn't show it. The only thing they could get is that, you know, there is some follow up by the CIA and, uh, well, his mother said the CIA must be actually the FBI who just kind of asked some general questions. And when they found out, you know, he was fine. That was it. That was the end of it. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, this is, you know, I, I think about this and I think about, um, you know, people looking at the Westboro Baptist Church and saying, oh, that's what Christians are like. All right. Um, nobody's investigating the Christians. Um, well, and WBC is obnoxious and horrible, but they're not, um, they're not violent. All right. Um, but, you know, you've got examples of, you know, people that kill abortion doctors and, and things like that in the name of Christianity. And clearly that's not what Jesus taught. And it gets a little hazier when you get into Islam just because, uh, Muhammad was a military leader. And so, I mean, his, his approach to things was very different that, you know, I would say that there's a reason that Istanbul is not Constantinople. Um, and it's because of military conquest and there um, might be giants. Yeah. <laughs> the, you know, it's because, uh, because of forced conversions. All right. And, and that's reality. Uh, at the same time, most Western Muslims are, you know, sort of what's their reaction to it. They're embarrassed by it. All right. They're embarrassed by it the same way the Christians are embarrassed by, um, you know, people like the Westboro Baptist Church. And do they denounce it as much? A lot do, all right? Um, but at the same time, a lot of them are afraid to. You know, we can denounce the Westboro Baptist Church. The worst that's going to happen is they're going to come pick at our church, and our church is going to get some publicity out of it. So, um, um, but... It, on the other hand, what the, was that? It's my phone. <laughs> it was they might be giants, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, sorry, you got to silence that. Um, the uh, what was that? The where you have with Muslims, it's it's more you know th these groups are more violent, but you know. Western Muslims that don't believe in in radical um, Islam, uh, not only do they not want to be connected to it, um, they got to be careful because if they speak out too much, they can become targets, and they don't want that to happen. All right, um, you can talk to Christians who are uh, uh, sort of former Muslims who become Christians; they're in all kinds of danger, not only themselves but their families. I mean these radical Muslims, they're like the mafia. You know? They'll target you or if you have especially if you're uh you know, first or second generation in this country, um, and they'll they'll target your family, um, who's still back in um in Africa or Asia or or wherever they mm -hmm. are. But especially in the Middle East where um where there's laws are a little bit more lax or at least the enforcement's a little bit more lax about um, attacking people for their beliefs. Um, so, I mean, that definitely has to be taken into consideration too. Uh, the big fear here is that we're going to start sort of rounding up the Muslims like we did to the Japanese in, um, in World War II, which I, I really think is a stretch and, uh, more of a scare tactic. At the same time, I'm not, I don't quite understand, you know, this is sort of being compared to McCarthy uh, kind of thing, which it does look a lot like. Um, it, I, I would think that this is more the sort of thing that should be left in the hands of the FBI and the CIA instead of Congress, because they're not really accomplishing anything. Find a happy place! Find a happy place! Find a happy place! Like, how about you, you know, get the budget figured out instead? <laughs> Just saying. Well, I just always remember P.G. O'Rourke's book, 
parliament of whores, you know, uh, and, you know, what do they do in Congress and why does it cost so much money? And we're after some, it, it, it was, you know, he said, you know, here, they just went through this court case, checking out this car. The car was fine. There's no problem. And then they held hearings about it in Congress. I mean, yeah, you know, that's what they do. They hold hearings in Congress. What? And then they come up with a report. And the report, you know, kind of goes in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's just the way they are. Yeah. So. Well, um, okay. Let's finish it off here. Um, last week we talked about um, homosexuality and couples wanting to adopt. Excuse me, or do foster care out in Eng- out in England? Today we go back to my former state of Illinois, yep. and now we we touched on this topic last fall, in which there was a gay couple who wanted to ad- adopt this fifteen year old kid, and Lutheran Child and Family Services said no, you can't do that. And um, since that time, the um, uh, the gay lobby has been calling foul and been saying, uh, no, 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 no. They cannot uh, discriminate. And uh, if they're going to do this for, with tax dollars, they can't discriminate. Um, and, you know, this is like, I don't know what this is. The Windy City Media Group. Oh, okay. It's, it's, a, it's a gay site. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, so they kind of work to put this thing, the, the worst possible issue I love these, um, I don't know, um, news reports that are really much more uh, opinion articles than they are news reports. And propaganda. Right. Uh, well, I mean, just the fact, you know, he quotes this lawyer. This lawyer says, no, 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 uh, religious exemption wouldn't apply in this case. Uh, this other one, you know, ACLU guy, no, 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 it wouldn't apply in this case. Well, you know, you, you want to go out and find some people who maybe see this from another perspective? Uh, because don't tell me that's the only perspective that exists in Illinois on the on whether or not the religious exemption uh, actually works. Right. Um, actually, the one thing I find most troubling in this, and I'd like to find out, okay, because being in Illinois, I used to, I, I knew Lutheran Child Family Services. Um, uh, Gene Savopkin, uh, who heads it up is a, a, a strong guy. Uh, LCEF is, is Missouri Synod or, uh, uh, related, as opposed to Lutheran Social Services of Illinois, which is the ELCA related one out there. Um, and uh, he said, uh, according to the March 2nd Chicago Tribune, uh, he indicated that uh, LCEF would likely change their LCFS. policy to avoid the risk. What? LCFS. LCFS, right. What did I say? You said LCEF, which is a... Oh, L- L- LCFS. Yeah. These Missouri Senate acronyms, you know. will start with Indicated L. that um, they would uh, change their policy to avoid the risk of losing their state contract. Um, and that, uh, that that's been okayed by a spokesman for the denomination. Um I have a hard time seeing that because uh, we, you know, I mean, we, we kind of made one of the first uh, choices on that out here. And it was very much, that was not the uh, the uh, out, outlook that, that we were given at all. And now for something completely different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and that's, I, I'd be interesting and inter- interested to see what direction this goes and, and, and to get more information as this develops, um, which, I, you know, just wanted to sort of check in on it. And, but yeah, that's, that's sort of strange because that hasn't been, um, the way things go. It, it may be, uh, temporarily that they're, you know, doing that until they make a decision. Cause you know, once you say, uh, no, you know, we're not going to do this. And, and they say, well, look, you either do it or you lose your license, you know, and, and that's it. it. It's sort of final. And so, well, okay, for now, until we can get this figured out, you know, uh, I could see him doing something like that as sort of a temporary stay in a sense. Um, 
but that yeah that certainly hasn't been the way that the Missouri Senate has operated um up to this point so it, you know it really does emphasize the the question of you know here we've got right in the first amendment of the constitution the freedom of um of to for people to practice their own religion and um and there's nothing anywhere in the constitution about um about rights regarding people's sexual preferences um and yet you uh you know they're making these these assertions that are unconstitutional and i you know and if there was some if if they actually had some sort of legal basis then it seems worth discussing um but the problem is is it's not there's no legality here um it's it's purely just based on people's particular position on a very complicated issue and, it, and it's trying to you know sort of oversimplify something that's really not all that simple on on either side and you know we've talked about the um because it's such a complicated issue we don't know what the long-term uh, repercussions are going to be and um you know sort of jumping into something when we just don't know enough about it uh and and it's it's something that's completely new i've uh, never had state sponsored you know up until modern times um uh sort of legalized uh gay marriage and and things like that and and this is kind of a similar thing um that you know we don't know what the long term effects all of the the situations in the in the past uh that had people in in you know where you have these sort of um gay relationships like people always mentioned oh well the greek army or you know something like that okay well the greek army did encourage homosexual behavior but then um when the war was done these guys went home to their wives you know and so the it wasn't that they were it was pro homosexuality they were just encouraging a a certain kind of behavior for a certain period of time um you know on the other side you know my my heart goes out to people who uh find themselves that that their partic- particular sexual attraction is to um to somebody of the same sex um you know that's a struggle mm-hmm. okay i looked up the chicago tribune article that was that uh, was mentioned here and i've been reading it as you've been making your commentary okay and um i have to kind of laugh at some of this it, number one a lot of these people um you know it doesn't come up very often because a lot of them they go these are religious organizations a lot of the gay couples just just go to the state or some some other option thing anyway this guy points out there are you know old okay there's evangelical family services ch- catholic charities uh lutheran child family services that 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 are affected here three count it three organizations you know what i can count that on one hand okay there are 57 other private child adoption agencies and DCFS itself, or D, yeah, DCFS. So there's 58 places you can go. Why are you making a deal about dealing with three? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm okay. glad you found that because yeah, that that makes a huge difference. Right. So you know, um, let's see. Uh, and uh, it says, uh, I like this one. Foster children should be placed with a relative whenever possible, experts say, which I agree. If that relative is gay, a religious agency may insist on referring them to a new agency, sever the child's relationship with a caseworker. To communicate to that kid that you have to change caseworkers in order to get the service you need is a very bad message, said this lawyer for the ACLU. Um, 
The other thing we're saying to a subpopulation of kids that are gay and lesbian is, once you grow up, you can never be a foster parent in our agency. Another troubling message. Okay, this guy... Uh, having adopted kids to foster care agencies and having... Do you have any idea how many often kids change caseworkers? Yeah. They do it all the time. Uh-huh. And it can be for a lot of reasons. All kinds of reasons, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And, uh, you know, and, yeah, you know, just like, you're, you know, we're, you know, your case is going to another agent. You don't need to sit there and say, the guy's gay. That's the problem. No, you just say, you're going to, you know, yeah. this can be handled by a different agency. You'll have a new caseworker. I'll introduce you. End of story. I mean, it happens all the time, you know, that uh, stuff. Um, you know, and I, I don't think you're saying anything to these kids. Uh, because you're just, you know, yeah, okay, you can never be a foster parent in our agency. Go to one of the other 58 agencies. Right. You know, this, yeah, this, is, mean, this is just like, uh, or it's, it's, it's analogous to the, um, the pharmacists who are forced to, um, to dispense abortion drugs. Okay. Right. Where they say, look, I will refer you to another pharmacist that does. I just cannot do it myself in good conscience. All right. And mm -hmm. these guys have gotten, um, threatens and, and, you know, and, and been forced to, to sell this stuff and all that kind of thing. It's the same kind of thing. Like we'll refer you to somebody that'll help you. We're just not going to help you. All right. I like this one. A study by the university of Illinois children and family research center found some children balanced between foster homes because they face difficulties when they reveal their sexual orientation. I don't think you can overemphasize the damage done by a disruption, says John Knight, another ACLU attorney. Gosh, I know kids got bounced around from foster home to foster home for all kinds of reasons. But you know what? Reality reality wise, this is, that has nothing to do with, with L C E F mm -hmm. or any other adoption age. You know, that's that is the, the, the foster parents saying, I don't want to deal with a gay kid. Right, right. Whether that's because right or wrong. That has it, nothing to do with the agency. That is the decision of the parent, uh, of the foster parents. Right, because and that could be a foster parent in any agency, because right. there none of this nowhere does this say anything about um, does this uh, sort of dictating who who they can or can't work with. Right, it's not saying that they're not going to help gay kids. Right, this is specifically involving whether the parents are in. A gay relationship, right? And and reality wise, I can see a, a lot of kids in foster care who are just you know going through some or, you know checking out the orientation, acting out a lot, and a lot of foster parents don't want to put up with it. They don't yeah. want to put up with the kid acting out and causing trouble. Right. It may sound you know I mean yeah, and I love the terminology, acting out. I mean, you know, it sounds like so benign. Um, you know, I can tell you, you know, kid going out, sleeping around, uh, getting drunk, doing drugs, um, yeah, getting running pregnant, away and yeah, running away. I mean, there's, there's some real, you know, act, you know, it could be some fear stuff, but a lot of stuff parents don't want to put up with it. Okay. So anyhow, back to, um, LCEF. Um, LCFS. Oh, L L yeah, LCFS here. Lutheran Drop Family Services. I'm tired, man. I got five hours of sleep last night. Okay? When Jim's tired, he thinks um, about money. I, that's right. Just <laughs> saying. Uh, it serves more than 700 children in the Illinois foster care system. By the way, interestingly, it said that the first foster care system in Illinois was, church, was Catholic Charities. The state took it all, you know, copied them. Um. Anyhow, it said, so they have 700 kids, uh, and they will likely change its policy to abide by state law. We're trying to develop our strategies for how we respond to the situation, says Gene Savakin, the organization's president and chief CEO. There's no way we're going to jeopardize the, those programs. Um, so I'm not sure they're saying that they're going to change it. I think there's, you know, how, how, how are we going to react depending on what they say? Uh, because a lot of times, I mean, you know, the thing is, is if you don't offer foster care and adoptive services, you're not allowed to do group home things, you're not allowed to do other stuff. But 
hang on here. Just Barbara Bulo, assistant to Matt Harrison, president of the Missouri Synod, says she does not foresee the Missouri Synod cutting ties with Lutheran Child and Family Services if it relaxes the policy and places children in gay households. There you go. From the horse's These gray mouth. areas are one of the most difficult places for anyone in the church to work through because it's hard to see your way through it, she said. We do have an obligation as a church body to help them through this and help them sort it out, but to find a solution that is mutually acceptable. Hmm. I wonder if some of Matt Harrison's supporters know he said this, that she said this. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Because I want to know, because one of the issues that we've had is, you know, we've told, basically told the ELCA, if you don't change your stance on, uh, you know, uh, uh, ordaining gay, gays and lesbians as pastors, we're probably going to end up ending social ministry work together. How does that jive with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if we're, if, if we're placing kids in, in gay, you know, if we're actually doing social ministry that is promoting, um, you know, you, you're putting kids in, in gay households and, and things like that. Um, wow. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's more directly connected, um, to the, you know, to this Especially whole because we said in, um, uh, and they even quote which year that was, uh, in a, uh, you know, in, in convention that, uh, uh, we, do not believe that children should be placed in gay families. Um, and, um, and so it'd be interesting to see how that's actually going. 2006 issued a proclamation that's not a proclamation, but actually voted on a resolution at district at synodical convention, which is supposed to be binding uh, until it changed. Said that placing adoptive or foster care, foster children in a household with gay parents would violate church teachings. There you go. So, uh, that is, that's gonna be, uh, that, that, that I find this kind of interesting actually from my church political viewpoint. Hmm. Uh, Next convention should be interesting, huh? <laughs> could be. Could be. If people bring this up. Now, from what it's worth, you know, I mean, I don't think there's anything particularly Lutheran. Now, the evangelical one says that they worked to specifically place people, place kids in evangelical Christian families. Does the Lutheran, they don't, you know, work to place them, I think, in, you know, specifically Lutheran families. I wonder how much real Lutheranism goes on in that. Mm-hmm. You know, but uh, but I think it's interesting. Maybe I'll even write Matt Harrison's office and say, um, "Why are you allow? You know, why are you allowing them to violate?" I might I might do that. Just just the hey, and we'll report back if you hear anything. Yeah, yeah, I will. I might do just have some. Oh man, I just have no time. That's my problem. <laughs> I have no time to be a rabble rouser. Yeah, that's my problem too. I used to do that. <laughs> I got involved in church work, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. And yeah, I just got involved with you know dealing with people, going to, going you know taking care of people. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, anything else tonight, Dale? Um, no, I don't think so. Just a reminder to if you're a iPhone or iPod or iPad user, uh, to. Go grab the Shepherd of the Ridge app. Let me know what you think. Um, working on an Android version, but I mean, like, very early stages. It's going to be a little while um, before that's available. I've got a few other things on the plate right now. So, uh, which are all really exciting kind of things. Um, and uh, just want to wish everybody a very blessed Lent season. Um, it's a, you know, it's a time for reflection on your sin. Uh, and but also a reflection on the forgiveness that God has given us in Christ. So. And Dale has a lot of sin to reflect on. So. <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> so.
So, oh, that's all I've got. So, okay. Um, all right. Good night, everybody. God bless.